We can do better, George. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. Well, this was such a welcome. Good morning to all of you online. I'm sure I was. Uh, yeah, yeah. But anyway, great that you are here. Great to see you today. And uh, if you've been following this series, which has been in conjunction with our um, 40 Days of Prayer book, you will see that this is a rhythm that is an essential rhythm of Christian life, and it's the rhythm of worship. Uh, Next week, however, you have a bonus rhythm, and uh, that rhythm is with Rich Horn. And it's the rhythm of community. And if I would say, I just think that's an essential. That's an absolutely essential rhythm. Um, Worship. I remember I was a young Christian and I was sitting at this meeting and I I just sat there. I was having a day. Uh, I had a few of them, actually. I had a few days like that where I just thought, I don't feel like it. In fact, I don't really know why I was there, really, because I just sat there and I thought, I don't feel like it. And I I just felt a sort of prompt from God as to, uh, why aren't you worshipping? So I said, I don't feel like it. I don't you ever get that. Don't feel like it. I mean, it wasn't actually a one-off. I knew I had a tendency, just, I don't, I, don't, I don't feel like it. And then um, I felt the Lord just say to me, am I worthy? <sighs> well, that shook me to the core. I just thought, oh my goodness me, I never even thought about that. Oh God, I thought it was all about me. But it's not, it's all about him. And I thought, oh Lord, I'm so I really struck a chord in my life. So in regards to worship, we often associate it with music and song. But to purely do that would be to seriously diminish this absolutely essential rhythm of the Christian life. John Piper, he's a church leader and author of numerous books, and he writes this, true worship is a valuing or a treasuring of God above all things. A valuing or treasuring of God above all things. Now, the reason I've said that twice is I would like us to say it. Okay? So I'm just going to say it a third time, and then we're going to say it together. See, is a, when we talk about worship, is a valuing or treasuring of God above all things. Let's say that together. Worship is a valuing or treasuring of... Brilliant. Let's do that again, shall we? Worship is a valuing or treasuring of God above all things. So with that in mind, we're going to Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 28 to 31. If you have a Bible, open it there, because it's always good to find your way around your Bible, and, um, or it's probably on your phone or something like that. If not, it should come up on the screen here, and we're going to read this passage. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked of him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God... The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Now, second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. So I want to look at two aspects in regard to the rhythm of worship today. I want to go firstly, uh, well, now, worship is a revelation. So you've got to, worship begins with revelation. It comes from a place of revelation. 
And then after that, so that'll be sort of half the message, and then after that we'll get into some how-tos or what, what to do, uh, rhythms and patterns. So first of all, it's a revelation, and that's what Jesus does with this young man. Well, I don't know if he's young, but this teacher, he, 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 he takes him back into the law. It takes him exactly into revelation. So the background to this passage is that Jesus has been involved with numerous debates. So one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. So if you look at the rest of the chapter, you'll see as uh, just loads of questions um, from the Pharisees and the Sadducees, both of whom represented different religious parties and teachers of the law. They're all trying to catch him out. They're all trying to do a gotcha on Jesus. That's, what, that's what's going on here. Now this man doesn't come in a delegation. He seems to ask the question of his own volition. No hostility, no entrapment. So he asks the question of all the commandments, which is the most important? Which is the most important? Now in Jewish law, there were, there were a plethora of laws. I mean, so some, something around over 600, something 613 or whatever, uh, laws, and, on, and as well as commandments. So really he's asking, could you sum it all up? Could you, could you just give us a strap line of all this? What is the most important? And Jesus takes him back actually to the passage just after the Ten Commandments. So it's in Deuteronomy 6. And so... Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Now, if you were a Jew, you'd have known this is the Shema. And they, they knew this. They, they said this every day. Once in the morning, once in the evening. This is an affirmation of who they are, it's an affirmation of their faith. And then, so Jesus takes this man back to this place and he begins with a revelation here of who. That's really key, of who. There's nothing about um, worship to some cosmic force. There's nothing about, uh, or an unnamed, unknown power. I don't know if you've had conversations of that kind. I've had a few I'm surprised I'm sitting over a cup of coffee and this man says to me, Neil, the God I believe in, well, he's more like an invisible force. Okay. And he says, like, like a something. Well, that's really helpful, isn't it? Like a something. And actually, in fact, it's a theme that David Bennett uh, uses in his book, War of Loves, subtitled, the unexpected story of a gay activist discovering Jesus. And this young woman asks him if he believes there is a God. And he says, well, basically, I'm an atheist. But I believe, I believe there's a something, I guess. There's that little phrase, a something. And then he goes, I'm a spiritual person. I've heard this numerous times. And I think I have to be blind, blind to believe there's absolutely nothing behind life. Now, I, I, I suspect some of you have had various conversations of this kind, but you'll notice that force, you know, uh, power or whatever, it completely removes an identity right from the start. There's no place for relationship because it's a force. And then, and in addition to that, then you are not accountable to a force. It's just a force. So... Um, but Jesus directs this man to this passage to the one who has identity who has a personal history with his people the one who took them out of the land of Egypt and out of slavery hear O Israel the Lord our God the Lord is one you know, in other words, he is known. The Lord our God, Yahweh, he is known. He's not unnamed. The Lord is one. Why does he say that? 
So he says this because the nations surrounding God's people had many gods. They had a God to cover all eventualities, a God for rain, a God for fertility, a God for war. I mean, you name it, they had a God for it. Numerous occasions, hear, O Israel, our Lord God, our God is one. And he, and he says also, he is the Lord. So he is not a Lord. He is the Lord. You have to get that, you see. And, and he is, he is, he is our, our God. He is our God. This is kind of connection and relational connection with God. He's not unknown. He's not anonymous. Worship, my friends. I tell you, if you don't have a revelation of who he is, it'll never get started. It's a revelation of, of who. It's not an it of who. When Isaiah goes into the temple in Isaiah chapter 6, if you'd never read it, read it please read it. Uh, he has this vision of worship. You know, what captivates Isaiah is the one who is being worshipped. That's what gets him. His first words were, I saw the Lord. High, exalted. Train of his robe filled the temple. This just has a massive impact on Isaiah. I mean, he's blown away by it all. And the robe itself is never described. He only gets as far as the train. It's not a train of his robe. It's just magnificent. And it, listen, it fills the whole temple. And it's a sight bigger than this building, I can assure you. And all he can see is the train of the rope. Isaiah's just struck by it all. And, and around the Lord there is worship. Angelic beings calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Listen, all they are doing is responding to who God is. That's what's going on. That's what worship They're responding to who he is. They're captured, captivated, caught up with him. It's all inspired because of who God is. Isaiah, in the presence of such holiness, he falls apart. Woe is me. Woe is me. It's just one of those woes. I'm undone. I've just come apart in the presence. I've never experienced such holiness. And then there's... One of the things he says is, and one of the things he notices is, I'm a man of unclean lips. This, this man was considered the most righteous man in, in Israel. A man of unclean lips. And God atones for his sin. And he transforms this man and puts him together and sends him on mission. Worship begins with a revelation of who. You know, to Lord the love to to know the Lord is, is to love Him for who He is, and to love Him for Himself. We don't love the Lord for benefits, for gifts. You know, first of all, you got to love Him for who He is. You won't really progress in the Christian life if you don't get that. In my early years of being a Christian, I, 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 I walked away. I just walked away, and, but he didn't. He didn't walk away from me. I left him. He didn't leave me. And when I'd given up on myself, he hadn't given up on me. And I was so ashamed of my life he still called me his son, and he pursued me. Somebody wrote this phrase about the hound of heaven, and God on my case all the time. Sometimes it was exhausting. I was in places I didn't want him to be in. God, loving me. He never left me. And one day I'm sitting at the kitchen table, and I'm done. I've had enough. I'm sitting at the table, I give up. I wanted to sort my own life out. And I was never going to do it. 
This is just a joke. I thought I could sort my own life out. Anyway, I was sitting at this kitchen table and I'm sobbing. I'm sobbing. God comes. I, I tell him I'm sorry. I'm sorry and I name things. I, I'm sorry I did this. I'm sorry. You know all about it. And I, I, so, forgive me, Lord. And the shame and guilt of all those years walking away rolled off. Listen, I'm not saying that they're not tempted to come back again. But the Bible says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do I get an amen to that? Amen. Amen. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Experiencing the love of God and the forgiveness to clean on the inside. It's just an overwhelming remembering the clean on the inside. Experiencing the loving kindness of God who, who died for me. Jesus died for me and transforms my life. And this is a gospel of grace. That's good news. And grace is, is about undeserved favor. Well, if ever there was an undeserved, it was me. And uh, God, God did it. See, we love him for who he is. He reveals himself to us. We love him because he's lovely. And I, well, I love him because he's truly wonderful. It's a revelation. It's an encounter. I was thinking about this uh, in, my, um, in my room as I was preparing for today. And I, I sat there and I just, I just cried with the love of God touching my life all afresh and anew. It is an encounter, but it's not just one encounter. We're in a relationship with him, Christians. So how do we do this? So let's say, well, how do we do it? Heart, soul, mind, <laughs> strength. Love's not some superficial thing. It's often portrayed like that in, in our culture. It's not casual. It's something that comes from the very depths of our being, heart and soul. It comes from deep inside. It's from the deepest part of me. Hence, that's why it is from the heart. It comes from the heart. We don't initiate this love, by the way. You know, I'm going to love the Lord. No, no, right? his, love, his love is shed abroad in our hearts. It's that we love. Why do we love? Because what? He first loved us. It, it's a whole response to him. In the book of Revelation, Jesus has a word for each of the churches, seven churches. And the word to the church in Ephesus is basically, you have got it all together. You want to read it. I mean, the list is impressive. It's good deeds. I know your good deeds, your hard work, sound doctrine, perseverance, Enduring hardship, stamina. Uh, One thing. Just one thing. You've lost your first love. Question. Have you? Christians of you, have you lost your first love? It's a really good question to ask. Because sometimes we just get into the routine of doing things and whatever. And that seeps away. Have you lost your first love? How do we continue with that first love? I think one of the things that I say is continue as you first started. Continue as you first started. Now, what I mean by that is it's everyday dependency. Everyday dependency. This is what's so important. When I first became a Christian, I wanted to talk to the Lord about everything. Everything... I, I, you know, nothing seemed too small, nothing too unimportant, nothing too trivial. I just found somebody who loves me so much. I just want to talk about everything. And, and, and to be honest, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, I, I needed to talk through. I, I, but I wanted to grasp everything I could get in this new life with Jesus Christ. You know, but along the way, I, our lives get ordered, ordered. And sometimes the chaos gets removed and there's a bit of 
order into our lives and, and we can lose that dependency on him. Strangely enough, thanks, I'll take over now. I don't know, we, it's just a subtle thing that happens. Following Jesus is not a process of getting in by grace and then becoming less and less dependent on him. It's not. The gospel of grace is not a runway to get us into the Christian life. It isn't. This gospel of grace is the Christian life. It is the Christian life. We, listen, we become more dependent, not less. How else can we discover the riches of his grace? How can you discover that unless we're more dependent, not less? Somebody writes, one reason some Christians remain shallow their whole lives is that they do not allow themselves to pass through the painful corridor of honesty about who they really are. It's like the iceberg, you know, and they all say about an iceberg, is you, temp, there's the 10% on top and there's 90% below, and you can be ever looking in and looking at the 10% which is on show to everybody else, and the 90% is what really makes you up. That's what you really are. You know, with him we can be utterly honest. I I can do this because I know his love for me. I can bring my shame, my disappointment of myself still happening, my indifference, words that I say, thoughts. I'm good at that one. Thoughts, because nobody can see them, but I, I know them. And, uh, and deeds. Sometimes, sometimes the Holy Spirit prompts me. Just a little nudge. Not sure that was very kind. And then, uh, and then it prompts me about, do you know what? You're so self-absorbed, you missed all about that person. He's right. You know, these, we can bring all this to him. He wants to change us. From one degree of glory to another. Church, my friends, you can bring it all to him. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian and how disappointed you are in yourself. Doesn't Just bring it to him. You're so loved, so valued. And when you mess up, you can take all your weaknesses and failures and you would say, oh, you must get bored. Not again. Yes, again. And he'll just, he'll take it. He'll love you. God's grace gives us the courage to face the painful truth about ourselves. Why? Because we have a safety net of the gospel of Jesus Christ who died for us, that we might have new life in him. That's a great safety net. You can bring it all. Every day, dependency on him. Continue where you first started. Second, Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Church, God's primary revelation of himself is in his word. So I'm asking you, be serious about his word. Please do that. Because the God of the Bible speaks. His word feeds me. It nourishes me. It tells me all about him and what he is like and how I can how I can come to him and how I can approach him. It tells me all these things. It tells me who he is and who I am now in Christ. Be serious about his word. I think when I say be serious, it sounds like John McEnroe at Wimbledon, doesn't it? You cannot be serious. But now be serious about his word, my friends. I've recently been reading through the life of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's a bit of an eye-opener. If you've never been there, I think, how does God use these people? <laughs> it gives you a lot of faith for you, I tell you. You want to read it. And then, but alongside it, I've been reading short commentaries. And I, I've just taken a little bit of passage each day. And I, I read a little bit of the commentary. And I've made notes in the commentary. <sighs> it's, it's been wonderful. And it's just been life-giving. It's just a short chapter. It, 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 uh, Listen, if reading doesn't work, do audio, whatever, but be serious about God's word. And, and in here, I'm reading about messy people and messy lives, and all the time, God's there. 
He never butts out. Never leaving, never forsaking. Christians, your God is so faithful. God's word and the truth has left me with nothing but thankfulness and gratitude. And also with a lot of questions too. But that's okay. It's God's word. You, you, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is the one faith whose founder tells us to bring not our doing, but our needs. My friends, please, don't miss the word. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. Draw near to God. Be serious about God's word. Continue where you first started, everyday dependency. Just a quickie, be wholehearted. Be wholehearted. Heart, soul, mind, strength, that means all of you. So be wholehearted. I don't know if you ever sat in a room with half a dozen half-hearted people. It's a life-sapping experience, I can tell you. I mean, you just sit there and they don't want to be there. And I don't want to, it's just, it's just life-sapping. Don't be like that. And this is not a personality thing that, you know, all wholehearted people are people who are out there. No. It's not a personality thing. What I'm saying is be wholehearted, my friends. Be wholehearted. This is an exclusive relationship. Jesus wants the whole of your life, not just part of it. You're going to have competition. You're going to have to knock down small idols that want to set up shop in your heart. Somebody said the heart is like an, our heart is like an idol-making factory. Little idols that cause you to drift Career promises you to be somebody. Money, well, it entices you for security. Materialism for some sort of validation. I mean, even the good things, like family and friendships, good things. Look, listen, all of those things, are, ter- are just, they're temporary. They're flawed. Sorry, that's your family I talked about. Talk to me afterwards. These things are too flimsy for you to anchor your life on. You cannot do that. Only God can hold the true weight, significance, and worth of your life. Only God can do it. To stick it on somebody else is just unfair. Don't do it to them. Lastly, worship in spirit and in truth. Through the heart and the head, emotions and thought. Ezekiel prophesies that God will give you a new heart, a new spirit in you. Do you know, if we, if we don't have that, we'll just end up as a choral society. Love it if you love choral society, but that, this is, that's not God's work. Unless it's God's work, you'll end up singing songs, merely singing songs, moved by tradition or even the melody. No, we worship in spirit And in truth, it's a God-given hallelujah. We worship the Lord personally. We also corporately. And Hebrews tells us, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. So the New Testament describes the church as a body, a building, living stones being built together, a, a household. You know, the primary purpose of togetherness is to worship God You look at the early church, temple courts in their homes. I mean, it's clear as we come together to exhort it to praise and to sing. A scripture's full of songs. I said this before, Miriam sings, Moses sings, David sings, Mary sings. I mean, and I'm just just a few of the songs. And then we've got a whole book of songs in here. Declaration about God, who God is, what he has done celebration, adoration, lament. It's all in here. There's a dynamic of worshiping God together that exceeds our personal worship. Hear that. When you're away, I, I do personal, I got, uh, I'm not minimizing personal worship. It's an everyday part of my life. Oh, but coming together. <gasps> now, that's a different matter. There's a dynamic of us worshiping God in his presence together. Perspective changes. 
desires change. The Holy Spirit ministers to us. On more than one occasion, someone said to me, you know, whenever I come here, I just cry. I just cry. I've been doing this. I've been coming here for months. I just keep crying. I used to say silly things like, it wasn't that bad, was it? And then, but actually, it's, it's not that. I just tell them that God understands them better than we understand ourselves and let him do his work. God's at work. Others have been healed. Gifts have been released. Conviction of sin. It all happens as God. People come together. I'm not saying it can't happen privately, but it all happens as God. People come together. People are filled with the Spirit. That was me. I was sitting in a meeting. Few people there. I was praising God. I was praising God. And I just... I was just overwhelmed by the love of God and the grace of God. And I ran out of words. And I was just so overcome with him. I started to speak in tongues and praise God in tongues. I was just overwhelmed and filled with the Spirit. It was wonderful. It's an essential mix. Spirit, truth, honoring God together. The story of God's people is a collective story. It really is. God's heart is every tribe and nation. And we have a privilege of seeing that here at King's. This is what Paul calls one new man in Christ. We have such a rich mix here of different cultures, backgrounds, generations, not because it's a good idea or politically correct. It's always been God's intention to pull all these people together. It is a wonder. It is the best wonder of the world, God's people together. And it speaks volumes. So we're going to finish here by reading Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 to 12. And the words will come up on screen. And we're going to stand. Because they often did that. They stood as God's word was proclaimed. And we're going to speak them this together. So don't leave me on my own. All right, just join in. Verse 9. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders, the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Wow. I believe we're going to break bread now, aren't we? Is that right? So what a great opportunity for us together as this wonderful company of people. Just, Just a glimpse you read just, a, we're just a glimpse of what's happening in heaven or what we will see. And then what, what better is it for us to have a meal together? Praise God. Thank you.